Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Let's get straight to the docket. First, Paul Pelosi pleads guilty. Dylan Round's parents now want your help. Alec Murdoch's attorney files a motion blasting the prosecution. Stephen Avery of Making a Murderer now says he has new evidence. Arkansas police beating update. A pastor is in some big, big trouble. Can you guess for what? And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't, like if you do, hit that button. And remember, you can listen to us anytime by downloading any of the programs here on any of your favorite podcasting apps. All right, let's go ahead and get to the docket for August 23rd of 2022. First on the docket, Paul Pelosi pled guilty to a DUI charge stemming from his May car accident and arrest. Now, according to records, Mr. Pelosi pled guilty to one count of driving under the influence, commonly known as a DUI. He was, he was sentenced to three years probation and five days of jail time with credit for time served. As part of the uh, probationary terms, Mr. Pelosi has to complete eight hours of a court work program, do three months drinking and driving course, and put an ignition interlock device on his car for a year. And he was also ordered to pay a fine of $150. Now, as you may recall, Mr. Pelosi was involved in a car accident the night of May 28th near Wine Country, Cops said that he was driving a 2021 Porsche when a Jeep struck it in a two-vehicle crash. The California Highway Patrol officers who responded say that Mr. Pelosi had objective signs of symptoms of alcohol intoxication, which include bloodshot, watery eyes, slurred speech, and a strong odor of an unknown alcoholic beverage on his breath. According to the police report, Mr. Pelosi handed officers his 11-99 foundation card when they asked him for his ID. How did that get here? Oh, by the way, officers, I'm a police booster here. Let me, oh, here's my ID too, yeah. It happens all the time. Well, the foundation provides financial assistance and scholarships to the California Highway Patrol officers and their families. And it gets mixed up all the time with your license, particularly when you're drunk or trying to use it to hopefully get a little professional courtesy to get out of the charge. But hey, let's face it, who wouldn't have tried, right? Needless to say, he was charged with two misdemeanors uh, the following month, driving under the influence of alcohol, causing injury, and driving uh, with a 0 0.08 blood alcohol level because his BAC was 0 0.82, which is obviously over the legal limit. Now, Mr. Pelosi did not show up at court today. That's right. His attorney showed up for him. Now, normally in those type of cases, the judge makes the defendant show up. But I'm not going to say that there was something nefarious or something that went on uh, there in California is probably just the way it takes place there. And frankly, this plea seems like a pretty routine plea. And most DAs would usually offer a lower charge of driving while um, ability was impaired, given the fact that uh, the BAC was uh, so close to the legal limit. But normally, when there's an accident, you have to plead guilty to the DUI. So Overall, it wasn't that uh, bad of a day for Mr. Pelosi. I'm sure he can find somebody to drive him around in his Porsche or many of the other cars that I'm sure he probably owns. So anyway, case closed. Next on the docket, guess what? Now they want your help. Remember the parents of a uh, young man from eastern Idaho who vanished near the Utah-Nevada border? Well, they want a different law enforcement agency to take over the investigation of their missing son. As you may recall, Dylan Rounds, who turned uh, 20 on August 1st, disappeared nearly three months ago while farming in the desert town of Lucen, Utah. His grandmother spoke with him on May 28th, and nobody has heard from him since. There's been no sign of Dylan anywhere and no activity of his cell phone or bank account, according to his parents. Well, the Box Elder County Sheriff's Office in Utah has been the lead agency on the case, but Justin Rounds and Candace Cooley, Dylan's parents, believe mistakes have been made in the investigation and they are frustrated by the lack of communication. Quote, if Box Elder can't even communicate with us as parents, can't even pick up the phone once a week, why are they even working his case because there's no point? Now, Cooley says 
that in an interview uh, with the newspaper. This is absolutely ridiculous. We should not have to beg for everything in this case, end quote. Dylan's parents said they were rarely hear from anyone at the Box Elder County Sheriff's Office. They were stunned when information the family was asked to keep quiet was released on July 28th on the National Missing and Unidentified Persons Systems. It said after Dylan disappeared, his truck was locked and the key fob was missing. However, the key fob was brought back and placed in the residence, which is Dylan's trailer, by an unknown person, apparently. The information about the key fob has since been removed and Dylan's parents were told it was accidentally submitted to the service uh, by a detective, obviously by mistake. Rounds and Cooley say the day the key fob was found in Dylan's camper trailer, investigators didn't seem to care. That happened on day number three after Dylan disappeared. They didn't even think to treat it as suspicious. They didn't start thinking, something's not right. Somebody's bringing this kid's stuff back now and he's missing? No, nothing. They just continued on their merry way, according to Cooley. Now, Chase Venstra and James Brenner, two men believed to have interacted with Dylan in the days before he vanished, were arrested last month for felony gun crimes in Utah, and they have not been charged in connection with Dylan's disappearance. But Dylan's parents believe Brenner knows what happened to their son. Brenner was squatting on property near Dylan, and they wish Box Elder investigators would have questioned the neighbor immediately. Court records indicate that he was not interviewed until June 7th, 10 days after Dylan spoke with anyone, and Brenner had an arrest warrant at the time that Dylan disappeared. Now, Box Elder knew this. He could have been arrested on day one, Cooley argues. You have a violent criminal and you have a missing 19-year-old all within 100 yards of each other, and you don't even think, let's go and execute this warrant because we can get this guy to jail right now? The Cooley's talking. Now, Dylan's parents say investigators have never interviewed them and in a letter to the Box Elder Sheriff's Office, cite multiple errors, omissions, lies, and misconduct as reasons why they want the state of Utah to take over the case with the assistance from the FBI. Now, the Rounds and Coolies have not heard back from the Sheriff's Office since they requested uh, this change last week, but a spokesman from the Sheriff's Office said they are working on a response. They said, quote, we received their request, but do not have a response for media outlets we are now preparing a response to Dylan's parents. That was the Box Elder County uh, Sheriff T Chief Deputy Cade Palmer. They said that they are also currently don't have any updates or new information on the investigation that they can share with anyone. The case continues to be actively investigated by the Box Elder County Sheriff's Office with the assistance of other agencies. Now, as you may recall, there were lots of people that were looking for Dylan Rounds. There were lots of people volunteering their own time, and they were going to go out and help and assist law enforcement. Not interfere with, but assist law enforcement. And remember, the family for Dylan Rounds said, we don't want you there. You're only going to interfere. You're not going to help. And guess what? Now this case is completely off the headlines. It kind of reminds me about the case that we talked about yesterday, the young girl that disappeared, Kylie Rodney. And um, guess what? The police looked at some place. Some experts came in, found the missing car, which turned out to, in fact, be the missing young lady. And I'm not trying to bash police in any way. I'm just simply saying they have limited resources. There's only so many hours in the day. Why would you not want citizens' help? There are so many people out there that can investigate. We're not talking having citizens go make citizens' arrests or anything like that. But if you have information or you come across information, you can certainly forward it to the police and they can do what they need to do to make an arrest. I'm not sure I necessarily uh, agree with Dylan Round's family, like just go arrest that guy. Well, you can't arrest it, somebody or go search their house unless you have some sort of probable cause. So I get it. They're angry. They're frustrated. They're, they miss their son, uh, Dylan Rounds. Uh, but you, were, you had literally thousands of people that were willing to go uh, look for him, go look for your son to see what they can find out. Who knows? He could be not far away, just like the young lady just the other day. You have to assume nothing when it comes to these investigations. Next on the docket, let's talk about Alex Murdoch and the motion that his attorney filed in his case. 
Now, as you may recall, Alec Murdoch, he's got a couple of legal troubles going on. He's got the theft cases. He's got some drug cases. He's got a attempt to try to harm himself case. Oh, and by the way, he's also charged with the double homicide of his wife and son. He's got legal issues. What can I say? Well, the prosecution has to turn over discovery to the defense. And it's a little interesting because there was a big story a couple weeks ago said the defense has received the discovery. Now the attorney general has said we are not going to disseminate the discovery to the defense unless and until they sign a protective order. Now what's a protective order? It's really just a promise by the parties and usually submitted to the court and then it becomes an official court order that the parties are not going to release the information to third parties. It can only be in the possession of the attorneys, investigators, or other experts related to the case. It's very, very common. And oftentimes you see that in federal court in regards to big drug conspiracy cases where they do not want confidential informants information getting out. And it may put witnesses in some sort of jeopardy. Well, here, it seems as though the attorney general doesn't want to release the information because they believe that the defense may disseminate it to the press. Well, Mr. Um, Murdoch's attorneys had a little something to say about this, and um, it's kind of interesting. And uh, he goes through the first page of kind of venting about protective orders and things of that. But he says here on page three, for months on end, the state prosecutors have selectively leaked information about evidence obtained through sealed search warrants to various media outlets. There have been stories written in the media about audio recordings obtained from Paul Murdoch's cell phone that allegedly places Alex Murdoch at the scene of the murders. Any search of Paul Murdoch's phone would have been the result of a search warrant issued under seal. According to the lead prosecutor, Creighton Waters, the order sealing the search warrant signed by Judge Newman and the other judicial officers also prohibit the disclosure of information obtained from these searches. Yet, defense counsel first learned that agents obtained information from a search of Paul's phone through news articles. Defense counsel has confirmed the existence of a video and audio recording from the search of Paul's phone that were first reported by the media. On Wednesday, August 17th, 2022, SLED agents acting at the direction of Attorney General's office played portions of a video and audio recording obtained from Paul's phone to Murdoch's family members. It is believed that this was done without obtaining an order authorizing the disclosure of this information to potential witnesses or third parties. In any event, on the recording, Paul is taking a video of his friend's dog who Paul was concerned about. Apparently, a conversation between Maggie, Paul, and Alex is also captured on the recording. Family members report that Maggie, Paul, and Alex are having a nice conversation about the behavior of their own dog, Bubba. There is absolutely no indication of a disagreement or dispute between Paul, Maggie, and Alex, according to the family members who viewed the recording. However, the state contends that within minutes after this nice, lard-hearted conversation, Alex Murdoch murdered both Maggie and Paul for no apparent reason. The story about the recording did not include any information about the nice nature of the conversation and how incongruent the tone and tenor of the conversation is to uh, the state's theory of the case. Perhaps this crucial information was intentionally omitted from the media leak to portray Alex Murdoch as the worst in the worst possible light. Regardless, the state has disclosed this information in violation of this court's order, sealing the search warrant applications and the material obtained from the searches. But now that the time has come for the attorney general to produce this mountain of evidence against Murdoch and has been described in the media to the defense, the attorney general refuses to comply with a discovery obligation until the court imposes a gag order or other restrictions on the defendant and his counsel. Lastly, the state continues to use this material, which should have been disclosed to the defense already, in witness interviews and other witness preparations for trial, while Alex's counsel are reduced to motion practice begging to see the evidence to be used against him. This conduct is grossly unfair to the defense and a violation of Alex's constitutional rights through the due process of law and a fair trial. Now, I understand Mr. Murdoch's attorney's frustration. You want to get the discovery, but the DA has signed the protection order. 
hey, why should I sign the protection or you've already leaked everything? You're using stuff that should be sealed. I get that. It's frustrating. But guess what? Alex Murdoch's attorneys, Mr. Harp Mr. Harpatulian, Harpulian, Harp however you pronounce his name, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. The point is he's going to have to sign the protective order more than likely, or there's going to be no protective order. But a good point here, ladies and gentlemen, you see the information that you learn from the filings in a case. Do you see why it's so important for these records to be available to the public? The public has just as much right to know what is going on. Now, the prosecution, the defense, you know, they can't do anything unethical. The prosecution and the defense can talk about a case, but they can't talk about it to the extent that it is going to prejudice either side uh, in their case. But sometimes bad evidence is prejudicial. It's just the way it is. Normally, it's prejudicial to the defense. But the point is, you see how important it is that we glean this new information from the pleadings that have been filed. Hello, Judge Boyce, Hori Vallimatter. Hello. See what I'm talking about? See why important? This is made available because the judge says we're doing this in public. It's important, ladies and gentlemen. It's important. So anyway, I get it. The defense is upset. They want their discovery. And hey, I hope they release it. I hope there is no protective order. And then this information will be provided to the public because that's where the truth will come out. Like many Americans, we got a dog during the pandemic. My quarantine dog, Miss Winnie the Bulldog. Now, Miss Winnie has grown accustomed to being around us all the time. When we were leaving the house, Winnie would have extreme anxiety, so we decided to look for natural products to help with her anxiety. We looked for the highest quality CBD treats, and we were not satisfied, and neither was Winnie. So we created a high quality CBD product that absorbs faster and provides the required results faster. Baked in Colorado CBD treats and beverage enhancers are made with nanotechnology. The nanotechnology makes the CBD extraction more pure, also allows for Baked in Colorado products to work faster. Baked in Colorado products can help reduce your pet's anxiety, ease joint pain, and help with your dog's skin problems. Go to our online store and see what Baked in Colorado product is best for your dog. When you order at bakedincolorado.com, enter code WINNIE and receive 15% off your first order. We have a 30-day money-back guarantee. If your dog does not experience the desired results in 30 days, return the product and we will refund your money. No questions asked. Next on the docket, Stephen Avery, trying again. So the attorney for Stephen Avery, that's right, of the making of a murder, has released a third motion for post-conviction relief for his 2007 conviction in the killing of Teresa Halbach. Now, Kathleen Zeller filed the motion August 16th in the Manitowoc County Circuit Court. I'm sure I got that wrong. Mr. Avery is requesting an evidentiary hearing on the basis of two new witnesses with new and compelling evidence about a murder mystery that obviously has intrigued the worldwide audience. The case was the subject of the Netflix true crime docuseries, Make It of a Murder, and Zellner claims that the witnesses can provide new and undisputed evidence that directly links a third party suspect to the murder of Teresa Halbach and the framing of Mr. Avery. Now, the third party suspect is identified as one of Avery's nephew in the Dassey family. Now, as you may recall, Miss Halbach was murdered on October 31st, 2005. She had visited the Avery salvage yard um, to photograph a vehicle for a magazine. Halbach was reported uh, missing. Her RAV4 was found at the Avery salvage yard on November 5th of 2005. Investigators found bone fragments in a burn pit on the property. Now, Zell Zellner claims the third party suspect killed and mutilated Halbach and planted evidence in her vehicle, including Avery's blood on the seat and dash and DNA on the hood latch. Now, Zellner says the real motive of the killing of Halbach was sexual homicide, as the third party suspect was known to view violent pornography. Now, the third party suspect was a key witness against Avery at trial. A forensic examination of the DASI computer found searches for words like DNA, bondage, stab, fire, and deleted and recovered pornography depicting the torture of mutilation of young women. 
Now, Zellner says evidence has been presented that shows the third party suspect was in possession of Teresa Halbach's vehicle and items that were used in the frame up of Mr. Avery. The motion alleges the new evidence shows that the Halbach vehicle was returned to Avery salvage yards from a different location, which Zellner says was corroborated by a witness who saw a vehicle similar to Halbach's leave the salvage yard and head toward Highway 147 between 3.30 p.m. and 4 p.m. on the date of the homicide. The witness observed the third-party suspect and another man pushing the RAV4 down Avery Road, which directly intersects with State Highway 147 in the early morning hours of November 5th of 2005. Now, this newly discovered evidence that a third-party suspect was in possession of Ms. Halbach's vehicle means that he had opportunity and access to plant evidence in the vehicle and from the vehicle, according to the motion. The motion states that the reasonable inference is that he planted bones in the Avery burn pit. Zellner is also claiming a Brady violation because a call to dispatch from a witness claiming to see the vehicle leave the property was not provided to previous counsel. Ms. Zellner alleges her office received the previously suppressed call on November 6, 2005. The recording had never been disclosed to the trial defense. Zellner says the existence of the call negates trial testimony that Hallbox RAV4 never left the property and that Avery was the last person to see Halbach alive. Another witness reported Halbach's RAV4 parked at a turnaround at Highway 147 and East Twin River Bridge on November 3rd and 4th, 2005. The witness stated he told a deputy about it, but no report was generated. Zellner says witness statements of the vehicle leaving the property support the theory that the RAV4 was later planted at the Avery salvage yard when it was discovered on November 5th of 2005. Now, Avery is serving a life sentence for a count of first-degree intentional homicide. A judge will decide whether to grant Avery a hearing based on the new evidence. And Judge Angela Sutquitz, S-U-T-K-I-E-W-I-C-Z, common spelling, is assigned to the case. She had previously denied Avery a motion for a new trial. Now, previous appeals have focused on claims of ineffective assistance of counsel, Brady violations, and destruction of bone fragments. The courts have continued to uphold Avery's conviction. And back in June, Avery was moved to a medium security at the Fox Lake Correctional Institution upon Zellner's request. He had previously been housed at maximum security Wapan Correctional Institution. Now, Avery's nephew, Brendan Dassey, was also convicted of killing Hallback. He will be able to ask for parole in 2048. Dassey appealed his conviction up to the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court justices declined to hear his case. Dassey's attorneys are now asking Governor Tony Evers to consider clemency or early release. They argue Dassey's confession to the crime was coerced by detectives, and Dassey was 16 at the time of his confession and deemed to be low IQ. In 2019, Dassey was moved from maximum security Columbia Correctional to the medium security Oshkosh Correctional. Next on the docket, a little Arkansas police beating update. So Randall Worcester was pinned down and punched by the three officers at a gas station in Mulberry near Little Rock on August 21st. He was taken to the hospital but not seriously injured and has been charged with battery, resisting arrest, and criminal trespass, among some other charges. All three officers, Deputy Zach King, Deputy Levi White, and Mulberry Police Officer Thel Riddle, have been suspended after the footage came to light. They were called to the gas station after... Uh, reports that Worcester, who is from South Carolina, was threatening a worker that he would cut off their face and they were and allegedly spitting on staff. When several officers went to confront him, he allegedly pushed the deputy to the ground and punched the back of his head. That's according to the responding officers. Worcester was already handcuffed by the cops when they launched into their attack on him. Now, all three officers were involved in the incident, but Riddle is particularly can be seen raising blows against Worcester. The veteran officer can be seen repeatedly hitting Worcester along with the other two. The county and the uh, city police uh, officer involved in this particular case, well, those municipalities 
probably need to get their checkbook ready. Now, is this going to be some crazy, you know, 13, 15, 27 million dollar settlement? No. Okay. And let's face it, the guy, Worcester, doesn't seem like a great guy. We'll give him the presumption of innocence, just like we will the officers in this particular case. He apparently was on the ground. And then they started telling him, stop resisting, stop resisting. You know, you got to stop resisting as he lay there on the ground. Was he resisting? I don't know. I mean, the bad angle, the cops, are, I don't know. Okay, he was getting his can of whoop ass put on him. Let's just put it that way. Okay, officers were wrong, but this guy's not going to get millions and millions of dollars because fortunately he doesn't have any serious injuries. But I bet once the attorney, because he's lawyered up, shows up, He's probably going to suffer, mark my words, brain injury, brain injury. Just my educated guess, Gre head hit the ground, traumatic brain injury. I bet you he'll never be the same, Mr. Worcester. Next on the docket, some more good news, just reinstilling your faith and trust in humanity. A grand jury has indicted a guy by the name of Sean Higgins. He's 31, and he's been charged with 75 counts that include charges of endangering the welfare of a child, aggravated sexual assault, criminal sexual conduct, cyber harassment, and obscenity to a minor. 13 of the counts um, relate to coaxing underage boys on social media to send him nude pictures and videos, then using that material to blackmail his victims into performing sexual acts on themselves for his abuse and enjoyment. When a boy would send a nude photo of himself, Higgins would instantly transform and warn the child, I've got you, and threaten to circulate the photo if the child did not engage in additional sexual acts on camera for Mr. Higgins' sick gratification um, because he was portraying himself as a girl originally. And then he said, oop, I got you. I'm going to blackmail you. Do this. So this is another good reason why you need to monitor your children's internet activity and also have those frank and sometimes uncomfortable discussions about the dangers of sharing nude photos or other embarrassing images of yourself online. It could be child pornography. Um, but you could open yourself up to situations like this, to be blackmailed, to be abused. Now, Mr. Higgins is accused of committing these crimes in 2020 while serving as the youth pastor and music leader at Harbor Baptist Church in Haynes Point and is serving as a teacher at the Harbor Baptist Academy, a private K-12 school that is housed in the same facility. Frank, have I mentioned this before? Youth, hanging out with youth? Hmm. I'm hanging out with youth. Have I mentioned this before? Yeah. yeah. Background check. <laughs> Background check, ladies and gentlemen. Just talking to Frank, the hardest working man in show business right over there. How many times have I got to say it? Well, the indictment also includes 13 victims arranging um, from ages 12 to 17 who reside in Alabama, Michigan, Minnesota, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, South Dakota, and Tennessee. The crimes for which he was indicted did not include physical contact, thank goodness, with the victims, and did not involve any members of the church congregation or students at the school. So at least he exercised a little bit of self-control there. The investigation revealed that Mr. Higgins would adopt the persona of a teenage girl and utilize Snapchat and Instagram to begin a conversation with the juvenile males, introducing himself as Julie Miller. After establishing a rapport, he would suggest that they trade photos. Higgins would then send pictures of an unidentified female teenager. In return, Mr. Higgins would often receive new photos that the victims took of themselves. And then, like I said, immediately upon receiving those, he would take the screenshot of the victim's friends list that was viable on the forward-facing social media platform. And Higgins would send the screenshot back to the victim and set to send the nude photos he had just received to a list of the victim's friends unless the victim did exactly what Mr. Higgins demanded. In most of the investigated cases, Higgins then demanded that his victims go into the bathroom and their residence and place the phone on the floor 
or at an angle looking up and instructed the victims to pleasure themselves or perform sexual acts on themselves. And Mr. Higgins would record what was transpiring. Victims would often beg Mr. Higgins to be allowed to stop engaging in his conduct, but Higgins would demand that they complete his instructions or face the consequences of having the recordings he was making of the incident be sent to their friends. Nice people out there, ladies and gentlemen. Nice people. And I'm a positive guy. Literally, glass always half full with me. Really, it is. But some days it just makes you wonder, where do these people come from? Why are they not wired correctly? What the hell are they doing? Just saying. Next, finally, our dumb criminal of the day. A Maryland man allegedly assaulted a Papa John's worker with a metal pizza paddle in an attack that ended with the employee stabbing the customer in the stomach with a pizza spear, according to the police. Investigators say that after purchasing a pizza Wednesday evening, Mr. Herbert Harris returned to a Papa John's in Woodbridge, a community 20 miles outside of Baltimore, to complain that the garlic sauce and pepperoni were not included with the pizza. Like, seriously? My God, seriously? Come on, Papa John, get your act together. Now, Mr. Harris, cops allege, argued that the missing Italian peppers and garlic sauce with um, Robert Klein, an employee uh, at uh, Papa John. Mr. Harris went behind the counter during the dispute and began chasing Mr. Klein around the store, physically assaulting him with a metal pizza paddle. Unable to escape the physical assault in fear of his safety, Mr. Klein, the pizza worker, grabbed a pizza spear to defend himself from the attack and stabbed Harris in self-defense, according to the police investigators. Or was it really? If he had done his job right, maybe this never would have happened. Just kidding. But I'm sure that's what somebody's going to say. Now, the spear is not further described in any of the uh, police statements, but I can imagine it has a pointy end. When the police arrived at the Papa John's, Harris, who lives two miles from the restaurant, was holding a t-shirt to the stab wound in his stomach, and he was ultimately transported to a local hospital for treatment for non-life-threatening injuries. Charged with misdemeanor assault, Harris is scheduled in court on September 20th. Oh my God, how dumb is that? We are talking about some condiments and some other add-ons to your pizza and this idiot goes down there and gets into an altercation? I'm sure Papa John's was like, fine, let me make you another pizza. Let me get you whatever you need because the customer's always right. And then you find yourself being chased around and being attacked with a pizza paddle, you know, the kind they slide into the uh, pizza to take the pizza out. Are you kidding me? What is wrong with these people? It is food. Are, it's not like people are food deprived in America that they got to fight for food. They're just upset that it's cold, hot, didn't get exactly what they wanted, and they go back in and start this stuff. What is going on in the world, ladies and gentlemen? If we should, instead of the dumb criminal, we're going to have to change it to the food assault of the day, the way things are going. All right. Thanks for watching. Please join us tonight, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, both YouTube and Facebook. Please join us. We'll be talking about the cases that you want to talk about, answering your questions. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk.